I'll start tonight back at one of those universities that Don told you about uh, that I graduated from, the University of Chicago. And we'll go back to the year 1959. 1959 was a great year for Darwinists because 1859 was the year of the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin's great classic. So 1959 was the centennial year and as that year came around, prominent Darwinists around the world thought that it ought to be commemorated with a grand gathering of evolutionary biologists. So arrangements were made and it was held at the University of Chicago. And this centennial gathering, the proceedings have been published in three volumes, um, is perhaps the greatest uh, commemorative event in the entire history of the theory. It was a triumphal occasion. The theme was one of conquest. Uh, it was one of the theory having prevailed over all oppositions and now becoming the central explanation of the history of life. The most honored speaker on that occasion was Julian Huxley, grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog because uh, Darwin being a retiring man, uh, of ill health, uh, Huxley, took the lead in debating the theory and advancing it in public. Uh, Julian Huxley wasn't just somebody's grandson, however. He was a very prominent evolutionary biologist, one of the founders of what is called the Neo-Darwinian synthesis, or synthetic theory, which is simply the modern contemporary version of uh, Darwinism uh, combined with Mendelian genetics. But Huxley wasn't only a biologist. Uh, he was a statesman the founding director of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, who set it on its uh, path, uh, for better or worse, but that's another subject I won't go into. Uh, he wasn't even just a biologist and a statesman. Uh, he was a philosopher, the founder or would-be founder of a new religion of evolutionary humanism. And so, as I say, he was the most prominently featured keynote speaker at the event. I'm going to read to you just a, some excerpts from what he said on that occasion. And I gave this uh, introduction be, to, to his remarks because I want you to realize that these were not casual remarks tossed off idly. Um, they were enthusiastically received statements of the leading figure of the Darwinian movement at its centennial. Says Huxley, Future historians will perhaps take this centennial week as epitomizing an important critical period in the history of this earth of ours, the period when the process of evolution in the person of inquiring man began to be truly conscious of itself. This is one of the first public occasions on which it has been frankly faced that all aspects of reality are subject to evolution. From atoms and stars to fish and flowers, from fish and flowers to human societies and values, indeed, that all reality is a single process of evolution. In 1859, Darwin opened the passage leading to a new psychosocial level with a new pattern of ideological organization, an evolution-centered organization of thought and belief. Man's destiny is to be the sole agent for the future evolution of this planet. In the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer either need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So did religion. Evolutionary man can no longer take refuge from his loneliness in the arms of a divinized father figure whom he himself has created, nor escape from the responsibility of making decisions by sheltering under the umbrella of divine authority nor absolve himself from the hard task of meeting his present problems and planning his future, can't shelter himself from these things by relying on the will of an omniscient but unfortunately inscrutable providence. Finally, the evolutionary vision is enabling us to discern, however incompletely, the lineaments of the new religion that we can be sure will arise to serve the needs of the coming era. Now, it would seem that we're dealing with something more than just a scientific theory. We're dealing with something that explains where we came from, the meaning of life, that sets um, our goals, that decides our destiny, um, that promises a new religion. 
And although those are particularly fulsome, particularly triumphant uh, uh, remarks, particularly ambitious remarks, similar sentiments occur throughout the Darwinist literature. Now, I'm going to focus on some of the issues that are raised by the things Huxley said. Um, and I'm going to focus on it particularly in terms of certain questions of vocabulary and words. And that might help you to understand why it would be that a lawyer or a legal scholar would be taking up this subject. Uh, I'm very interested in words and how they're used and how keep people can be confused or even deceived if words are used loosely. Vague definitions, shifting definitions, uh, can carry an argument by confusion. And I'm very interested in assumptions, the assumptions that lie behind arguments, the concealed assumptions, the things that aren't said but are silently there implicit in the argument. Now, for example, why did Huxley insist that evolution excludes creation? The earth was not created, it evolved, he said. Many people would say, well, these are consistent in some way. You could create by evolution, couldn't you? Well, let's take a look at that. Now, first, what's creation? And second, what's evolution? Now, creation is a term that is used in very funny ways in our public discourse. Creation or creationism, when you see it in the newspapers or in a scientific textbook um, or uh, perhaps hear it on a public television program, it usually is referring to a specific uh, a position sometimes called creation science, uh, which is in a very ambitious position based on a very literal reading of the book of Genesis. Uh, it asserts that creation took place only a few thousand years ago, um, that it took uh, six 24-hour days and a day of rest, a single week, um, and uh, that, in short, it was thus sudden, abrupt a creation of things pretty much as they are. Now, that's one meaning that one could give to creationism, as and I say that's the usual one. But creation also means something much broader, much more general, something that is, in fact, perfectly consistent with some definitions of evolution. Creation could simply mean that we are here as the products of an intelligent creator that brought about our existence for a purpose. In this case, uh, there wouldn't be any necessary objection to saying that the process took billions of years and that it was gradual rather than abrupt. It would still be creation if our existence and that of other living things was due to the conscious, purposeful activity of a creator. Now, the trick in this is that what Darwinist science will tend to do is say we have refuted creationism, narrow sense, by arguments that satisfy us, and never mind for the moment what those arguments are or how satisfactory they would be to you, but the point is that having refuted creationism, narrow sense, we will now treat it as if we had also refuted creationism, broad sense. So that's what Huxley had in mind, of course, was that the creation that was refuted by what he called evolution um, was not simply the biblical fundamentalist version of creation, but any notion of a creator bringing about our existence for the purpose. Um, so we're dealing with something much more than a Bible science conflict or something much more than the duration of the creative process. Now similarly, what is evolution? That's a parallel question when creation and evolution are uh, paired. Often evolution is defined either very broadly or in such a manner that it doesn't seem to talk about anything that's tremendously important from a religious or a philosophical sense. Thus, uh, for example, um, representatives of uh, the Darwinist uh, educational fraternity in debating me have sometimes said, well, what evolution is, is change over time. Things change. Well, why not? I mean, big deal. Uh, who cares uh, about anything as general and vague as that? Who would even care to dispute it and what, um, what uh, important statements is is that uh, making. Um, often evolution is described as change of any kind, even very minor change. Um, what um, uh, is often called in the uh, jargon of the field microevolution, 
One gets examples such as that there are variations in the beaks and tails of finches in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, these seem to have developed, um, diversified after migrating from the mainland. Well, very well. Uh, um, uh, who objects to that? But certainly evolution in that sense, a narrow form of diversification within the type, is not the kind of thing that leads one to launch into the kind of address that Julian Huxley gave at Chicago at 1859. It doesn't promise a new religion. It doesn't uh, uh, get rid of God or the creator. Uh, it doesn't have great philosophical implications. What evolution really means uh, to the Darwinist leadership, such as Huxley, is a completely naturalistic and materialistic process that accounts for the entire history of life and excludes design or ultimate purpose uh, from the entire field of nature. Uh, that is, it states that we are the product of purposeless, natural, material processes um, and that all of life from its origin uh, up to the present time and all of its vast complexity and diversity uh, can be explained on that basis and therefore should be explained on that basis and that's why as Huxley said we get rid of the creator and we go on uh, to promulgate the new religion. Now the, um, the proposition was very succinctly and classically stated by George Gaylord Simpson another one of the founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis who was present uh, at that time in his book The Meaning of Evolution so here's the meaning of evolution according to uh, Simpson. Although many details remain to be worked out, it is already evident that all the objective phenomena of the history of life can be explained by purely naturalistic or in a proper sense of the sometimes abused word materialistic factors. They, that is the objective phenomena of the history of life, they are readily explicable on the basis of differential reproduction in populations, well, that's natural selection, and the mainly random interplay of the known processes of heredity, that's random mutation, the other major element in the Darwinian uh, picture. Therefore, Simpson concludes, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Now we get to the metaphysical religious conclusion. And we see that that conclusion is not something new that's tacked on at the end. It's something that's really a restatement of what went before. What life, and particularly humans, are the result of materialistic factors, random mutation and natural selection. Therefore, life, human life, and, and life in general is not the product of intelligent, purposeful factors. It's simply to say the same thing in other language. Now, so one can see that the Darwinism or the theory of evolution that is metaphysically important, that's philosophically important, that's religiously important, is this grand theory that describes the entire history of life in materialistic terms. But because the same word evolution is also used to describe very vague statements or very specific and relatively unimportant phenomena, you can easily become confused. And you know, I run into this all the time that uh, uh, biology professors will, will write or you know, say, well, but uh, there are these variations in um, the beaks of finches. Um, there are species on the Hawaiian Islands which are uh, similar to members of the same families as somewhat different species on the mainland, you see. So that's evolution. So what's the problem? You know, we proved evolution. Well, you see, you prove something very, very narrow and then claim to have uh, proved something very, very big and important. So what's the key element in Darwinism, in the Darwinian theory of evolution? Uh, what's the really important part? What's the thing that needs to be defended and examined? Now, a major part of what I've been trying to accomplish in writing uh, the book, uh, Darwin on Trial, and in giving these lectures is to provide a vocabulary and a way of thinking that enables us not to be confused by the shifting terminology, that enables us to focus on the issues and see what needs to be proved and then see whether it has been proved or whether it might even have been disproved. In order to do that, 
we have to have specific language and we have to have a specific focus. So I'm going to use, I'm going to stop using the term evolution or even the term Darwinism now and I'm going to focus on what I will call the blind watchmaker thesis. Now this I've taken from the title of a famous book by Richard Dawkins, the uh, eminent uh, English uh, zoologist um, uh, and a popular author of The Selfish Gene as well as The Blind Watchmaker and a person who is generally regarded as uh, the leading proponent of a classical uh, Darwinian theory, that is, uh, the strictest version of the Darwinian theory uh, today. Um, the blind watchmaker thesis is aimed at answering the following problem, and I'll, I'll state the, the problem in Dawkins' own words. Dawkins begins his book by saying, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. That is, to put it in only slightly different words, one could say that if you just look at the living things, uh, Dawkins' opinion is they appear to be created. They appear to be the product of a creative designer. But, says Dawkins, this is an illusion. They aren't really, if you know the truth, because we know today that they are the products of random mutation and natural selection, this process which he calls metaphorically the blind watchmaker. And again in Dawkins' language, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. Blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences, and has no purpose in view. Yet the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design as if by a master watchmaker they impress us with the illusion of design and planning. So the blind watchmaker thesis then, which is simply the Darwinian mechanism, is aimed at explaining the thing that most importantly needs to be explained, which is the appearance of design and purpose in living things. The blind watchmaker thesis is something much more specific than evolution, as you can see, uh, because um, uh, uh, one can contrast it, to, for example, with the picture of evolution, which is shown in Stephen Jay Gould's famous book, recently very prominent book that some of you may have seen, Wonderful Life, where he is writing about what we call the Cambrian explosion, which is the sudden and apparently unprepared appearance of the animal phyla, the invertebrate animal phyla, in the Cambrian rocks, uh, with no indication of ancestral connections to anything that went before. There were some single-celled um, uh, animals that were in existence before, uh, but um, other complex plants and animals then appear suddenly without evolutionary links to these um, uh, uh, earlier forms. Uh, so uh, as Dawkins said of that, they appear to have been just planted there as if they were created instantly. Uh, but of course, he says that's not really the case. And Gould, describing this uh, phenomena, says that the... Um, I came, that it used to be thought that um, this was the result of an artifact of the fossil record, that all the ancestors, all the mediates, intermediates, a universe of ancestral forms were there. But now Gould says there's no good reason to believe that. They seem to have appeared um, suddenly, and, and either if there were any ancestors in between the single-celled forms and the complex forms, any intermediate forms, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't ones we can identify, um, and there don't seem to have been there's so many of them, in fact, you can't find any. Now, one can call that picture evolution, you say, because new forms have appeared and they have the same DNA code, some features in common with the earlier forms, uh, but there is no mechanism, nothing that describes how the designing was done and to get complex animals um, like insects and uh, uh, all sorts of um, uh, uh, forms, uh, one has to uh, do a lot of designing or have something that can do the job. So, the, so we're focusing tonight on this crucial element in the theory, the blind watchmaker thesis. And Dawkins uh, gives a, the best uh, possible defense of it I have on high authority. Um, Francis Crick, uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, advised all persons who have any doubts about the Darwinian theory uh, to read Dawkins' book and believe it. In his own words, he said, if you doubt the power of natural selection, I urge you to save your soul to read Dawkins' book. The language of spiritual combat is apt here. He's trying to save your soul from the alternative of creation. Well, is the blind watchmaker thesis true? 
can mutation and selection really make complex plants and animals from very simple predecessors, ultimately from non-living chemicals, uh, though chemical evolution involves separate issues? Can step-by-step -step mutation and selection build complex organs like wings, eyes, kidneys, and brains? And did they, in fact, do so? You can ask this question two ways, can't you? One, you can say, can they do it? Does scientific evidence indicate that it's possible? Um, and second is, did they do it? Does the historical evidence of the fossil record indicate that things actually happened that way? Well, let's take an example. I, this one that Dawkins uh, uses, and I'll, I'll read it to you because I think it, it's, it's, it's purely illustrative. Obviously, we can't go into a wealth of evidence in a single lecture. One can only use an illustrative example. So I'll try the example of how Dawkins explains the evolution of the wing. He's thinking really of uh, the bat wing rather than the bird or, uh, the in or insect wings uh, because uh, the bat is one of his uh, examples that he, he uses in the book. So he asks, how, do, how did wings get their start? Well, here's the answer, the blind watchmaker answer. Many animals leap from bow to bow and sometimes fall to the ground. Especially in a small animal, the whole body surface catches the air and assists the leap or breaks the fall, fall by acting as a crude aerofoil. Any tendency to increase the ratio of surface area to weight would help. For example, flaps of skin growing in the, out in the angles of joints. Now, it doesn't matter, says Dawkins, how small and un, unwing-like the first wing flaps were. There must be some height, call it H, such that an animal would just break its neck if it fell from that height, but would just survive if it fell from a slightly lower height. In this critical zone, any improvement, however slight, in the body surface's ability to catch the air and break the fall can make the difference between life and death. Natural selection will then favor slight prototype wing flaps. When these small flaps have become the norm, the critical height H will become slightly greater. Now, a slight further increase in the wing flaps will make the difference between life and death, and so on until we have proper wings. And that's the story of the wing. Now, you know, these stories, by the way, are regarded with a certain sardonic air, at least behind closed doors, in, uh, even in Darwinian circles. And uh, they're called sometimes just so stories. Uh, you know, how the elephant got his trunk, how the tiger got his stripes, and this is how the bat uh, got his wings. Now, I want to look at some of the logical flaws in the scenario. Um, and th by the way, those of you who um, have uh, had uh, evolutionary biology courses, either here or elsewhere, or are familiar with this subject, it'd be interesting to know, I um, hope you'll think about how much of this you've heard about. How much of this has been, you know, sort of clearly brought out, the difficulties uh, with the blind watchmaker thesis, or how much of this will be new. So let's start um, by looking at the logical problems with the thesis. Now to do that, I'm going to make a quick move to an argument that is always advanced in favor of the blind watchmaker view by Darwin himself, by Dawkins, and by everybody else that's done this. And this is the argument from the analogy to artificial selection. That is, the, 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 uh, one doesn't see these things developing in nature, and so the Darwinist argument will say, well, by analogy, we'll look and see what human breeders have done in breeding plants and animals. Um, and uh, will say that nature can do that and more. Uh, so here is Francis Crick again. I always like to pick very prestigious names to quote and to use so that um, everybody knows you're not picking on small fry. Um, making an argument that Dawkins, that Darwin himself and all his successors relied on. And here he is, I'll, I'll quote. He says, Dawkins, in The Blind Watchmaker, gives a nice argument to show how far the process of evolution can go in the time available to it. He points out that man, by selection, has produced an enormous variety of types of dogs, such as Pekingese, bulldogs, and so on, in the space of a few thousand years. Here, man is the important factor in the environment, and it is his peculiar tastes that have produced, by selective breeding, not design, the freaks of nature we see preserved all around us as domestic dogs. Yet the time required to do this on an evolutionary scale of hundreds of millions of years is extraordinarily short. So we should not be surprised at the ever greater variety of creatures that natural selection has produced on this much larger time scale. 
Now, that's the kind of argument that seems very, very persuasive to Darwinist minds, including the very best ones. But there are some things that are really wrong with it, obviously wrong, clearly wrong. Now, first, as is pretty well known, uh, all dogs, in fact, form one biological species. They're all chemically interfertile. Um, they can interbreed. And by that definition, by that usually used definition of a species, an isolated reproductive community, um, they, are, they are a single species. Now, I don't want to place too much emphasis on that, because for one thing, it would give the impression that if one can find an example, and one actually can in the plant world, where one can find breeding mutations that cross the species boundary in this reproductive community sense, that you've solved the problem of evolution. But that isn't really the major point. The major point is that the degree of variation and diversification which you get within dogs or anything else gives out after a period of time. And it gives out not because you've run out of time, not because you don't have enough time to continue breeding Great Danes until they get as big as elephants and then turn into elephants, but because <laughs> but because they stop changing. They stop growing bigger when the limits of the uh, capacity of the uh, gene pool are exhausted. Um, and thereafter, um, the, the, the attempt to get ever and greater freaks uh, gives out. So now the dog uh, species happens to be an unusually plastic uh, genome in the sense that one can achieve a great deal more variation in size and shape among dogs than one can among uh, many other kinds of creatures. Uh, but even in this example, it goes only so far and no further. And the limitation is not time. The limitation is the end of the uh, variation. Now, this is well known. The Darwinist answer to it must be that mutation supplies new capacity for variation. But then the question is, does that really happen? Or is mutation a kind of materialist version of miraculous creation? something that must appear because we need it and we couldn't get anywhere without it, but that there's no independent evidence that it actually appears on schedule. Remember, in that example of that little squirrel or whatever it was, mouse or squirrel or whatever that was trying to become a bat, um, that the wing flap mutation has to appear on schedule each time to make it uh, bigger and bigger. So uh, the question is then, what is the evidence that this appears? And in fact, this is well known to be one of the real weaknesses of the theory, mutation is wished for, uh, but not demonstrated. Now, that's one thing that's wrong with the analogy. The analogy, rightly uh, understood, shows the limits of change, not the infinite capacity of change. But there's something that's just as important that's wrong with it. And I think Crick is aware with it, because he tries very unsuccessfully to deal with it. You'll recall the sentence where he said, here man is the important factor in the environment, and it is, it is his peculiar tastes that have produced, by selective breeding, not by design, the freaks of nature we call domestic dogs. Now, see, behind that is concealed a real problem, which is that selective breeding, to the extent it produces these freaks of nature, does so because human breeders are conscious, intelligent agents with a purpose who apply their intelligence, considerable intelligence, because breeding isn't easy, uh, to select a for a predetermined goal. They're trying to get the greatest size possible. If it's sheep, maybe the greatest wool production, the greatest milk production. Uh, whatever feature they're trying to get, they select for. Pursue that goal relentlessly. And of course, they have to protect their creatures from the natural environment, natural selection, which would prevent any of this from happening if you didn't take very good care of the freaks of nature. Um, and indeed, the specialized breeds uh, become extinct rapidly if uh, the creatures are returned to the wild. So that what one sees in the analogy to artificial selection is it's really the opposite of what it's represented. It is, in fact, design acting within the limits of the capacity for variation of the genetic substance of the creature, particular kind of creature that you're dealing with. It's purposeful design pursued with intelligence and skill for a goal. Even so, it achieves only change within limits. And yet, this is the proof, or a crucial item of proof, that unconscious, because you know the blind watchmaker isn't just blind, the blind watchmaker is unconscious. Unconscious material forces can take a bacterium and given enough time, change it into a human being. 
proves the opposite. What it really proves is that even with intelligence, one only gets a change within limits. Now, there's more problems than that. We haven't, we've hardly even started with the problems with the blind watchmaker scenario. Another problem is that in this scenario, a heavy weight is placed on the qualification that other things must be equal. This squirrel, whatever, I'll just call it that to, to give it a name, that is falling from height H uh, will be benefited by a proto-flap, uh, you know, a little bit, maybe enough to make a difference, if other things are equal. But of course, one of the things that that proto-flap is likely to do is cause some awkwardness in grasping as the thing climbs trees and swings through the branches. So that um, it's, a, it's a typical uh, law of change of any kind that you often get more than one effect at the time. Uh, so that the limbs, which are in the process of changing into wings through the development of these flaps, if we imagine the process to occur in the first place, um, are apt to become awkward for grasping and climbing uh, before they become very useful, uh, for even for gliding, let alone flying. So other things aren't equal. If in fact the, the change causes a, um, uh, a greater incidence of falls, um, it's not going to be adaptive. Now this uh, process can be extended enormously because one has to imagine that as, as change in one direction, as specialization occurs, it may well be accompanied by other kinds of change in the organism that are not as directly connected to the flap as, the, as that example that I've just used. In case this change is accompanied by a thinner winter coat or a lowered sperm count or something like that, um, the animal is not going to leave more offspring uh, simply because um, it has some a greater ability to survive a fall. Now this is a particularly important because as uh, I'm sure many of you are well aware, uh, it is not the case that one can isolate a gene for this particular characteristic that has no effect on anything else, or at least that that's the general uh, uh, state of things. And in fact, uh, one feature which is relied upon very frequently for explanatory purposes in Darwinian uh, uh, circles is called pleiotropy. Um, which is the tendency of a gene to have multiple effects. Uh, so that a mutation uh, may have several different effects and one would not know whether it was going to increase the ability of the creature to have more offspring unless one knew what all the effects were and their features. Which is why, by the way, so many people will speak of natural selection as fundamentally a tautology. It can be formulated in ways that it isn't a tautology. But in most applications, um, the only way to judge whether a mutation is helpful in the sense of, in the only important Darwinian sense of having the creature leave more offspring than it otherwise would, would be to find out whether it left more offspring than it otherwise would have. That would be to, that is, whatever leaves offspring um, and comes to dominate the uh, um, uh, population must have been advantageous by definition. Uh, but in most cases, it's impossible to specify those features uh, in advance because, and certainly it's impossible to specify the kinds of mutations uh, that would provide uh, increased offspring. So we have yet another problem uh, with the um, a blind watchmaker scenario. We have the problem we don't know whether the mutations arrive and don't in fact have any evidence that they do or will. We have the problem uh, that uh, the effects of natural selection have been wrongly supported by showing of what conscious, purposeful selection can do. Um, and we have all the problems of multiple effects. Now we can add to that one further problem, which I think is probably the most decisive one in dealing with the theory, which is that the historical record, the fossil record, is simply not consistent uh, with this view of evolution. That is, even if we assume that something called evolution happened, that we'll agree to call evolution, um, that is, that new things appeared somehow and things developed out of other things, one has to take heroic measures, um, heroic ad hoc hypotheses in dealing with the fossil record uh, to get uh, anything like a Darwinian picture of evolution outside of it. Now, this is an important point to understand. Um, if evolution is going to have the meaning that Dawkins and Crick and Huxley and Simpson gave to it, evolution has to include the blind watchmaker thesis. 
Evolution without it, you see, doesn't, doesn't solve the problem of design. But if it's going to have the blind watchmaker thesis, it has to be step-by-step -step evolution by tiny micro-mutations which accumulate by natural selection. That at least has to be the general picture. Um, that, uh, uh, that is to say, what we'll not do in this sense is large-scale macro-mutations that change things all at once. Well, why not? Well, Dawkins is very insistent on this for the same reason that Darwin himself was which is that if you are going to postulate that new design features appear, new body plans appear in a single generation leap by a macro mutation, you're postulating a miracle, not a scientific event. Um, the level of complexity, um, it's like uh, producing um, a, a jump um, of, of a, a, an entirely new kind of designed product um, uh, in, a, in a wink of an eye. Um, an example I was using in a discussion uh, recently was it's like imagining that a glitch in your computer uh, takes your word-perfect word processing pro program and turns it into Microsoft Word. Um, now, you know, uh, all of this has to happen with an electronic uh, surge or something like this. Now, that's a miracle. Um, Dawkins and Darwin before him get rid of the miracle by saying that if the miracle happens in small enough stages, tiny micromutations, and they are preserved by cumulative selection, then a complex structure can be built little by little, tiny step by tiny step, without pre-existing intelligence, without a designer. That's the key thing. So evolution in this sense is inherently a gradual step-by-step -step process. And so don't be fooled when somebody says, well, we can have evolution without having Darwinism, without having the extreme gradualism associated by it, uh, because um, an evolution could occur in big jumps. Well, it, maybe it could, conceivably, but then one doesn't have the satisfactory explanation for the design problem, and which is why Darwin was so insistent on sticking to gradual step-by-step, tiny-step-by-tiny-step evolution in the, in the teeth of heated criticism. Now, why do you get the heated criticism? Well, it's because of what I've already indicated. The fossil record then and now doesn't show anything like that. What it shows pervasively is that although new forms appear in different kinds of rock, as in the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian rocks, they appear suddenly, a fully formed, and without a trace of the step-by-step -step lineage uh, from pre-existing forms. There are some claimed exceptions to this. They're all debatable in my judgment. They're covered in chapter six of my, my book. Interestingly, they're in the vertebrate sequence, uh, all the important ones leading up to human beings. Uh, but um, uh, pervasively, it's agreed by all of the authorities, the feature of the fossil record uh, that is most uh, uh, prominent is stasis. That is, things appear and they stay the same. Uh, they stay the same for millions of years, sometimes hundreds of millions of years, until they become extinct or until the present day if they're still with us, like the horseshoe crab and the shark. Through eons uh, of, of history, when in vast environmental changes that should have produced enormous Darwinian change if change occurred. Uh, what one finds then is, that is, is a total absence of examples of step-by-step -step change and what I think is even more significant, this tendency of things to stay the same um, and not to change in any directional or fundamental way. So one has to assume, in order to uphold the blind watchmaker thesis, that the vast evidence of the intermediate forms, in the case of the Cambrian explosion, the whole universe of transitional intermediates between the single-celled forms and the, comp and the dozens of complex animal phyla that appear thereafter, that this must have existed and disappeared. It's invisible. Uh, it must have been there because if it wasn't there, the theory wouldn't be true. Um, and similarly with, for example, mammals. Um, we have this, va within the single class of mammals, we have this vast variety of whales and bats and elephants and monkeys and humans and horses and, and so on. And all of these, if the theory is true, descended step by step from some primitive land-dwelling mammal that step by tiny step changed into a whale on the one hand and a bat on the other uh, through two uh, lineages. Well, if it happened, the evidence is uh, pervasively missing. 
Now, I think the criticism of the blind watchmaker thesis is devastating. And it's not original with me. If somebody wants to criticize this lecture or the, um, or the book by saying, well, um, this is all well known. We've heard that before. I'm delighted. Um, because indeed, um, um, I think uh, that these are matters which it only takes a bit of digging to br bring out and know about. Um, and um, it is by no means some idiosyncrasy uh, of my own uh, that I am persuaded that the blind watchmaker thesis is false. Um, many prominent uh, uh, evolutionary biologists have said essentially the same. Uh, from Richard Goldschmidt, the Berkeley professor of genetics, who said evolution must proceed by big jumps with hopeful monsters to Stephen Jay Gould, Harvard professor of today, who in a 1980 article uh, said that the neo-Darwinian synthesis as a general theory, as a general explanation, is effectively dead, despite its persistence as textbook orthodoxy, uh, to many others who have, who have said that they believe in evolution in some sense, but it must occur by some other and unknown uh, process. But none of this criticism has mattered. None of these acknowledgments, and in fact, some of the people, Gould's an example, who have, who have pronounced the death of the Darwinian synthesis, have, have at other times retreated into its arms. Now, why? Well, that's going to take us to a, another word. I've talked about what is creation and what is evolution. Now, I want to talk a bit about what is science. Because, you see, it's possible to set up a definition of science so that the Darwinian theory simply has to be true so that the evidence doesn't really matter, so that the blind watchmaker thesis, or something very much like it, uh, simply has to be true. Now, what is science? Well, yeah, so science to me, when I think of that, and I think what many people, we think of empirical research. You know, we think of fossil studies. We think of things, people looking at things through microscopes and electron microscopes, doing repeatable experiments, and that sort of thing. But science is also often used to describe a kind of philosophical system, and this is particularly true with respect to evolutionary biology. Now, the elements of that philosophical system are as follows. Because science studies only what is natural and material, only natural and material causes can exist, because anything else would be outside of science. Now, of course, the first place what this does is it takes a limitation of science and turns it into a dogmatic statement about the universe. Because science only studies certain kinds of things, uh, those are the only kinds of things that need to be considered. Now, that's the element of naturalism, one might say, in the definition of science that many people use. Now, the second element is that the business of science is providing ever more improved naturalistic explanations. Now, what this means is that when a theory, like the blind watchmaker thesis, is proposed and is plausible enough to receive a certain level of acceptance within the scientific community, it becomes established as the paradigm. And after that point, it cannot be simply dislodged and discarded. It can only be improved. And so a typical Darwinist response to negative criticism of the kind I've made is to say, what is your alternative? You see, if you were serious in this business, you wouldn't just be ne making negative criticisms. You'd be proposing new mechanisms. You'd be proposing, if the blind watchmaker mechanism isn't adequate, ones which are. Now, that, of course, says, in effect, that we don't know isn't an acceptable answer. We have to know at any given point. We can acknowledge that our answer will be improved in the future, but it can never be discarded. And anyone who doesn't understand that doesn't understand how science works. And believe you me, I have heard that phrase many, many times. In fact, I've said that when I finally pass from the scene, I want that carved on my tombstone. They all said he didn't know how science works. I know how science works. You assume what you want to assume, and then you say it's fact. <laughs> now, I, I don't feel bad about it, people saying I don't know how science works, because this has happened to some very eminent scientists. Pierre Grasset, the president of the French Academy, uh, the most uh, uh, prestigious zoologist in uh, Europe, um, wrote a book called The Evolution of Living Things in which he took the line that, well, evolution in some sense must be true, but the Darwinian theory is totally and completely wrong and against the evidence and it's just false and we have to start all over again and look for something else. 
Uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who along with Huxley and Simpson was among the founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, reviewed Grasset's book and said he doesn't understand how science works. Uh, he's the most knowledgeable zoologist uh, you know, in Europe, but he doesn't understand how science works because science works by improving the paradigm and to discard the whole thing in the hopes of finding something new someday uh, is contrary to the whole scientific method. Well, now you see if you put this all together, something like the black watchmaker thesis just has to be true because um, uh, we only admit naturalistic explanations. Some naturalistic explanation must be true. This is the best one we've got today. That's it. I mean, once you've reasoned that far, you've come to the answer. And no matter how many holes you shoot in the thing, it doesn't really matter. It's still the reigning paradigm. And purely negative uh, criticism is uh, uh, ruled out. Um, and uh, uh, so um, uh, one can uphold the theory simply on the logic of science against disproving arguments, however powerful. Now, and, I get, and indeed, that is a, you know, the sense in which it's true. I, I, it isn't that I don't understand how science works. It's that I don't agree with the, with the rules that are imposed by some people in the name of science. Um, and I rather insist that we must keep open the possibility that our favorite theory is simply wrong and we don't know the answer uh, to how all of these wonderfully complex uh, biological uh, organisms could have been created. Now, people are able to becloud your understanding by proposing tendentious and argumentative definitions of science because the word science is intimidating to people, and understandably so. We live in a great age of scientific technology. I mean, science produces things like uh, polio vaccines and rockets to the moon and atomic weapons and so on. Um, and that's got to be, rightly is, tremendously impressive to people. And so they tend to think that a philosophical position, which is associated with the scientific enterprise, must be as valid as the impressive technology uh, which it provides. And I think that's been um, uh, what has really kept many people from using their critical intelligence on things that come in the name of science. Um, this was particularly strong back in 1959, where we started, you know, in the, in, the, in the days right after the birth of atomic energy, when I think the prospects for technology seem more limitless than they do today. But they still are, of course, very, very impressive. However, there are two things, I think, which our century should have taught us about science, not just one. One is the one I've just mentioned. Scientific technology is so impressive, you know, that you've got to be impressed by it. But scientific technology, the impression, the, the, what's impressive about scientific technology refers to the parts of science that are established by repeatable experiments. That's what keeps scientists honest. That's what keeps them on track. It's not that they're better than the rest of human beings. It's that they've got to demonstrate their results and the, and the experiments have to be repeatable. Now, as an example to illustrate this, um, let me just tell you a, a hypothetical story based on this Challenger uh, space shuttle disaster. It's not the actual story, but it's a hypothetical story based on it. Um, that, uh, um, suppose that uh, you're, um, you have an, a laboratory which is designing the seals, uh, which seal the engines and uh, pr protect the craft from blowing up on a launch. And all of the PhDs and Nobel Prize winners in this laboratory and corporate vice presidents with all their authority, assert that the seals will work. But somebody, I don't know what, the office boy or office girl or the mailman or mail person or the, you know, whatever, somebody of low standing in the enterprise says they won't work. If the temperature is too cold, the crack and the thing will blow up. Now, we know that if the thing is the next week is shot off the launching pad and it blows up on the way into space, we know who is right and who is wrong. And the fact that there were tremendous credentials and tremendous cultural power in the people who said it wouldn't blow up doesn't mean a thing, because it did blow up. That one person, however humble, however lowly, is right. And that's what's so wonderful about the experimental method. It has to work at the end of the day. But now suppose that we did this Challenger spacecraft enterprise a little bit differently. You know, the US is running into budget problems. It's the state of California. We can't really afford the fuel anymore. But on the other hand, we can't cancel a program because all the contractors would you know, go out of business and the workers would lose their jobs and the politicians would lose the elections. So we keep the program going, but we save money by not sending it off into space. We build it. This is not so implausible, you know. We may get to where we're doing this. We build it, 
And then we hold a meeting of all the scientists and engineers that worked on it. And they agree by consensus whether it would have worked or whether it wouldn't have. <laughs> now the seals work, don't they? Everything works. You vote for mine and I'll vote for yours. Everything works. And if we can see this process extended over any period of time, we can imagine at the end of it we're going to end up with a spacecraft which is pretty unlikely to get off the launching pad if the fuel crisis has ever survived and we intend to fire it off. That is, we're still having a scientific process, but it's one which depends upon subjective judgment, consensus of the experts, rather than the crucial experimental testing. And that, of course, is what evolutionary biology is like. It's excusable. I'm not saying this to condemn the field, because what else can they do when you can't do the experiments to see what actually happened, uh, can't uh, uh, check things. But excusable or not isn't the point. The point is, it doesn't have the same reliability. And that's a second lesson. I should have said there were three lessons, because I'm going to give you a third lesson about science from this century. We've seen that scientific technology is tremendously impressive, and we've seen that's because of the experimental process and repeatable experiments. We've also seen something else that's just as impressive in a negative way, which is that philosophies tend to attach themselves to science. And they borrow illegitimately legitimacy from the success of scientific technology. What do I have in mind? I have in mind, of course, Marxism, the science of society, and Freudian psychoanalysis, the science of the mind. Both of them really offshoots of Darwinian thinking, which were accepted as science because they um, you employed scientific language and borrowed the prestige of science, but they did not rely on the same kinds of method and are now thoroughly in discredit in terms of their scientific status. Now, is Darwinism science like that experimental science that sends the rockets off into space, or is it science like Marxism and Freudianism? Well, if you will, I don't know if you, in any of your courses, you probably don't uh, use the evolutionary biology textbook by Douglas uh, Fatuma of the State University of New York at Buffalo because I think. Some local products are involved in another rival product. But um, Fatuma's a textbook, which is one of the leading ones for college evolutionary biology students, if you look at the introductory chapter, he says proudly, Darwin did for biology what Marx did for society and Freud uh, for the science of the mind. He advanced the program of materialism and mechanism. So I endorse Professor Fatuma's um, uh, analysis of this. Um, and uh, would suggest that we treat Darwinism to the skeptical uh, critique uh, which we've already given to Marxism and Freudianism. Now, um, we started this lecture by saying that the Darwinian theory is something that goes way beyond science. It's a philosophy. It's a religion. It's a metaphysical system that purports to explain everything and that explains everything really in the way of the logic of how things ought to be, how they, it seems they must be if you follow a certain logic, rather than because of any airtight or even less than airtight uh, evidentiary support. Now, um, when my book Darwin on Trial was reviewed in Nature, one might have expected that the world's most prestigious scientific journal would refute the errors of this upstart lawyer who dares to write about biology, would give, bring forward the evidence of the blind watchmaker's prowess uh, that I had uh, presumably ignored. The reviewer in Nature didn't do anything of the kind, didn't really challenge me on scientific grounds at all. The reviewer in the world's most authoritative scientific journal challenged the book on theological grounds. And he committed all the logical errors that I'm talking. This is Professor David Hull, the Northwestern University. I'll just read to you a couple paragraphs from his review, critical ones. It says, what kind of God can one infer from the sort of phenomena epitomized by the species on Darwin's Galapagos Islands? Now, this is a reference, you know, you'll recall, to microevolution, to those variations in beaks and finches and turtle shells. The, the, what, what, now, what kind of God is epitomized by the beaks and finches of variations? Fascinated. Let's take a look. He says, Hull continues, the evolutionary process is rife with happenstance, contingency, waste, death, pain, and horror. Millions of sperm and ova are produced that never unite to form a zygote. 
Of the millions of zygotes that are produced, only a few ever reach maturity. On current estimates, 95% of the DNA that an organism contains has no function. Certain organic systems are marvels of engineering, others are little more than contraptions. When the eggs that cuckoos lay in the nests of other birds hatch, the cuckoo chick proceeds to push the eggs of its foster parents out of the nest. The queens of a particular species of parasitic ant have only one remarkable adaptation, a serrated appendage, which they use to saw off the head of the host queen. Whatever the god implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant god of waste not, want not. I think Hull thinks that's a biblical uh, doctrine. He is also <laughs> not a loving god who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful god portrayed in the book of Job. The god of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of god to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. Now, Hull's logic, you see, in the review was that since the world of nature as shown by evolutionary theory and junk DNA and so on, um, uh, it, to him decisively refutes the existence of God, the blind watchmaker therefore must be able to create, and Johnson's skeptical arguments can be set aside without meeting them on the merits. I mean, that's, that's the inherent underlying logic. So what one sees here, again, is confirmation of the essential point that I've been making that what Darwinists have been doing is engaging in theological speculation in the name of science. Uh, that they have used traditional arguments like the argument from evil really here, or, which uh, would be the subject of another lecture to reply to, um, uh, to say that, well, we don't want to believe in a creator, we rule a creator out, we don't like the idea of a creator, it would interfere with science, it would be an evil creator given the way the world is, and so the blind watchmaker must be able to create. Now, what I think is really very unfortunate is that this theological argument becomes understood as if it were science. But this isn't what we go to biologists for, for expertise in the existence of God, uh, for philosophical arguments based on evil, uh, for examples of imperfect design. That's Stephen Gould's centerpiece argument against the deity and therefore for what he calls evolution which must mean the blind watchmaker thesis. What we ought to get and expect from scientists is science. That is to say, careful skeptical confirmation or disconfirmation of the central thesis, which is whether blind natural forces can do the job of creating. Now, I'm very happy to concede that once we disconfirm that thesis, as I'm convinced any fair review of the evidence will do, we'll be left with no answer to the problem of design. But there are also plenty of problems left. I mean, as I've said, the problem of evil and so on deserves separate treatment. And so there may be philosophical reasons and difficulties with the creator and, and all of that, and they can be discussed. But of course, the philosophers and the theologians, even those of a creation-centered viewpoint, ought to be invited to participate in that discussion. The atheists shouldn't have a monopoly of it and uh, be allowed to make uh, uh, selective reviews of the evidence and uh, 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 arguments without anybody having an opportunity to reply. You know, if I, if I could think of one thing that I would like to think of as the motto for my own work, for my project, what I'm trying to accomplish, I finally ran into it the other day, the perfect statement of it in a, in a statement I read which is attributed to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe a German literary and philosophical evolutionary uh, figure. I have a, a source for this. I hope it's an authentic quote, but uh, I'm, doing, I'm accepting it on faith for the moment. And it doesn't really matter because it's, uh, you know, the, it's the expression uh, uh, that, um, uh, that counts and that really uh, summarizes my view of what we've had in Darwinism. Here's what Goethe said. A false hypothesis is better than none at all, for that it is false does no harm at all. But when it fortifies itself, when it is accepted universally and becomes a kind of creed that nobody may doubt, that nobody may investigate, that is the disaster of which centuries suffer. That, of course, is when science turns into religion um, and misappropriates its success with experiment to support dogmatic statements that are way outside the province of science and that ought to be and are being effectively challenged at last. Thanks very much and uh, uh, now it's time for
question period. Uh, wow. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, um, in the February issue, I believe, of the Scientific uh, American Journal, they had an uh, article on Stanley Miller and Sidney Fox and their theory mm -hmm. of uh, how they created life in the laboratory. Did you read that? It was February 1991. I'm, I think I did read an art article in, in the Scientific American a, about a year ago. So I, it's well, what it did is probably it, the one it you're seemed like to. they said that their theory is no longer valid. And I was curious if someone has proposed another theory as oh. of late. Well, um, let me uh, sort of just explain briefly how I see things as standing in the field of origin of life. I'm, you know, uh, and then I can refer you to. There's a there's a really good literature on this um, uh, available. Uh, but basically, as of that year, 1959, when the Darwinian centennial occurred. Um, it appeared to the scientific community that the problem of the origin of life had been all but solved by an experiment done at the University of Chicago uh, by Stanley Miller with, in the laboratory of Harold Urey, it's the Miller-Urey experiment, which uh, essentially showed that if you put a certain combination of uh, chemical gases and uh, creating an, an uh, atmosphere that might or might not be like the one that was on the early Earth and sent energy through it, uh, you could produce certain chemicals, including some amino acids, which are used in constructing proteins. And this was seen as a partial confirmation of what's called the Oprah and Haldane thesis, which was that the amino acids build up in a prebiotic soup and then somehow combine to form some living form which thereafter evolved. Now, the, 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 the paradigm has been attacked on every conceivable angle. The literature on this is very good. There's a book by a convinced uh, scientific materialist, Robert Shapiro, called uh, origins, a skeptic's account of the origin of life from 1986 that I highly recommend. And then by somebody, you know, sort of on my side of the issues, by three people, Charles Thaxon, Walter Bradley, and Roger Olson, called The Mystery of Life's Origin, which is excellent. It's at a more technical level. People without any scientific background might have some difficulty with it. And there's some other good books and articles as well, including that Scientific American one, assuming we're thinking about the same thing. Now, what's happened today is that the field has collapsed into a series of rival paradigms. Um, all of which are mutually inconsistent. One that's gaining ground is that clay, silicon crystals somehow evolved and then genetic material came and took over. Um, uh, Sidney Fox, who you mentioned, says, well, proteins evolved first and then somehow DNA and RNA evolved in them and then you could get this operation of the cell going. Um, the, until very recently, the most popular view was, well, RNA came first. Uh, but now there have been articles just devastating the RNA first thesis. Um, the field of chemical evolution, as it's called, is very much in a, in a, in a process of paradigm crisis um, and mutually inconsistent hypotheses, and yet the scientists involved in it generally are very confident that they're about to solve it, and they'll give you statements like that. And there's an easy, it's easy to understand why. Because, you see, they all assume that the problem of the evolution of life from the first replicating macromolecule on has been solved by the blind watchmaker thesis. And that being the case, and since it was all virtually solved in 1859, with you know, details added later on, how can it be that our much more powerful science of today will long be stymied at taking the final step? Now, I believe, you see, that the thinking problem here is that the blind watchmaker thesis isn't true, and I think that this form of science is actually the modern version of alchemy. Um, that just as the alchemists could not con succeed in turning lead into gold, uh, they're not going to succeed in turning um, uh, non-living chemicals into, into life without the huge infusion of intelligence, whether, you know, natural or supernatural. So that's my view of that subject. And as I say, there's quite a good literature on it. Um, and and it, it's no longer just sort of repeating the party line of the scientific naturalist, but is actually critical now. I was wondering, what did, what's your view on um, vestigial structure, structures, such as the appendix in man? or the wings on bees, the partial wings. Yeah, the vestigial uh, uh, organs, I, I didn't hear it exactly at first. Well, um, a number of these turn out to have functions, um, and uh, uh, I don't know if that's going to turn out to be the case with everything. It's a, um, but um, it's, it's perfectly possible. I don't have any tremendous opposition you know, to considering the possibility that there are genuine vestigial organs that have somehow survived some process of change and development, which you could call evolution. 
I'm not convinced, of course, that just because something is said to be a vestigial organ at one point in time that it really doesn't have any function because a function may later be uh, discovered. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know the answer to all of those cases, uh, but it doesn't seem to me that whatever the answer might turn out to be would, would substantiate the blind watchmaker thesis, you know, which, as I say, is a really important proposition of evolution. Something else, some other kind of process of development and change might have occurred, and they might be, might, you know, conceivably be relics of it. That's the best I can do with that. Okay. Uh, Professor Johnson, you've given us a very articulate and lawyerly view, uh, which is a character, really, I'm afraid, of both science and evolutionary biology. And let me just make a couple of quick points. Most of the evolutionary biologists that I know adhere to uh, or profess belief in and work through a Popperian view of falsification. Indeed, they're not simply trying to work as many Marxists and Freudians have, but in point of fact, they consciously attempt to falsify their, their hypotheses. Secondly, in point of fact, there is a very good test of evolutionary theory by natural, or evolution by natural selection. And in fact, there have been some prominent people who have been trying for many, many years to falsify it. And you know what it is, it's group selection. In fact, David Wilson at the State University of New York at Buffalo has been trying for many years to, to falsify natural selection. Thirdly, there are, in fact, some very sound empirical studies that have been carried on for more than a decade that mimic the process of evolution and they have nothing to do with artificial selection and they have independent tests which allow them to, in fact, show that finches, as it turns out, are in fact maximizing their reproductive success and behaving in ways that absolutely boggle the mind. In fact, they facultatively select uh, or are selectively engage in infanticide. Fourthly, it's well known, I think, there's one or two people, oddballs around, that in fact natural selection is not a tautology. And as I just mentioned, if in fact you can come up with some evidence for group selection, you'll get a Nobel Prize and then some. Well, I thought you said that group selection was well established, so... No, no, group selection how... is not well established. Oh, I thought so I, I misunderstood fact, you. In point of fact, if you can show that group selection is operative in the natural world, I guarantee you'll get a Nobel Prize. Why would I want to do that? I don't, well, never mind. Well, Go ahead. This, yeah. Because if you can show that, that group selection works, then we won't have to worry about evolution by natural selection any longer. That's another form of natural selection. It's at the group level rather than the individual. No, it's not a form. I'm sorry. It's not a form of evolution by natural selection as evolutionary biologists. Uh, is, is there a question you have in mind, sir? No, I just wonder. No. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, say that, um, you know, um, the idea that there is such a thing as natural selection and that it has some effects, or that there is such a thing as adaptation in the sense that finches or any other number of creatures do some remarkable things that advance their survival is not controversial. The question is how you get finches in the first place. And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, of course, if finches or humans are born, which are severely defective, for example, they do not survive absent intrusive medical care, and you can call that natural selection. It's totally uncontroversial. The question is the creative power. Really, the important thing you know isn't so much the selection. It's the claim that mutations add massive amounts of new genetic information by purely random processes. That's the thing that there really isn't any evidence of. Hello. Um, you had a quote here where you said, you assume what you want to assume, and then you say it's a fact. That, was my, that wasn't a quote, that was my own off-the-cuff observation. Well, that would be my observation about religion, not science. Religion makes up stories. And then the Scopes Monkey Trial was about passing laws to prevent other theories from being taught to school children. That's assuming it's a fact. Well, I'll be glad to respond to that. As a matter of fact, uh, I very much strongly support academic freedom at all levels and the consideration of all hypotheses at all levels. In fact, that's very much why I'm engaged in this present operation, because what we have here is a group which has, of, of people with a strong philosophical agenda which have taken control of the scientific establishment and the science education establishment and are engaging in a program of indoctrination. Uh, to put over the, the blind watchmaker thesis um, without allowing fair consideration of the very valid objections to it. So that's what I stand for, is open consideration and discussion of hypotheses and objections to them. Um, 
first, as far as open consideration and discussion, I've been challenging Campus Crusade for a debate on this issue for a long time, and I've simply been told that they're not going to do it. But my question is... I would have been very happy to debate Professor Ayala. It would have been nice if someone else... Had... I, uh, he, declined, he, declined one, he declined one opportunity, but I understand he gave this lecture a big plug. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned at one point that 95% of the DNA is redundant, or you called it junk DNA. Is it possible that over the billions of years of development that the organisms that exist today have reached a plateau where the process of mutation cannot get in to add new genetic material? because there is so much junk around the outside, and that unless you went back to a simpler, more primitive form of DNA, you would never see mutation take place. And your example of using a squirrel-sized mammal as developing wings would be totally misleading because the actual, when the wings first developed, would have been possibly microscopic. Well, I was, you know, I was uh, really just trying to follow Dawkins' uh, example. But see, I don't have any objection to considering any possibilities. What I have objection to is the, is the, um, the very thing that you said uh, uh, at the beginning, um, making assumptions and then treating them as fact. Now, the problem I have with many Darwinists, including, by the way, many dear friends and colleagues with whom I have uh, vigorous discussions of these subjects, um, is that their education has trained their minds to think of evolution, that's the word they would use, as a total system, like you know, Huxley said, it's a single process that explains everything. And it's just self-evidently true. Um, so that they really can't entertain the possibility that it could be false. And now, now to see, I'm trying to refine it by talking about the blind watchmaker thesis, talking about something that is much more uh, specific, because what they'll tend to do is give an argument that assumes the truth of the theory, you know, and then say, so, you know, all this junk DNA, you can't have mutations today, that explains the absence of evidence. But it doesn't establish the theory, it's based on an assumption that it's true, and so you can explain away um, uh, the, the absence of uh, 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 confirming evidence. I think we have to consider the theory independent of any bias in its favor. And that is very difficult to do for people who have been trained to think of the theory as just, you know, self-evidently true and, and, any, and any questioning as amounting to unreason. Um, is the existence of God a fact or just a theory? Do you consider that a fact? The, the, the existence of God, I think, is predominantly a metaphysical proposition. Um, that, um, well, if a fact, it depends what, it, what you mean by fact and by theory, but that's not a subject I deal with in this uh, lecture. I deal with uh, Darwinism. I would be glad to give another lecture on uh, re reasons for the existence of God, but I don't want to get into it offhandedly. But I said, I, I don't think I can answer that. We'd have to define the terms. You're aware of it. What, what his argument about what? About contingency. Conti that, for example, he has the panda's thumb argument, which is that carnivora has lost thumbs. Yeah. And so when panda bears want to hold bamboo, they don't have a thumb, but they created another bone from their wrist. And it's hard to imagine that arising if the panda bear was designed from scratch, whereas if you believe that it evolved from other carnivores, then it seems quite reasonable. Well, um, I'm very familiar with the panda's thumb argument. You know, I, uh, I have a a young friend uh, uh, named Paul Nelson who's just getting his uh, PhD from the University of Chicago in this area, who's uh, in philosophy of science, who's uh, written a whole paper on the Gould pandas thumb argument and the many, many problems with reasoning in, in, uh, in that way. Um, the, the basic claim is that because the pandas thumb is an extension of the wrist bone rather than you know, the kind of thumb that we have, that it must have evolved by some haphazard process rather than being designed, that it's sort of imperfect. Well, this is a very subjective way of deciding things, I mean, for other things from my point of view, because it, in fact, functions very well. I don't see that it really settles any question of design. But in any event, we can't settle a question as to whether the blind watchmaker did everything or whether pre-existing intelligence was observed by simply allowing somebody who has a, a strong position on that to select a piece of evidence or two and say, well, see, this is the kind of thing that looks to me and maybe to you like the product of a haphazard process. So now we've established the blind watchmaker thesis. We've got to consider all the evidence you know, and look at it systematically. Um, so really, I, I characterize Gould's argument on this as a theological argument in any case. You know, he says, we look at something, we decide if it looks imperfect and haphazard to us. It therefore is the kind of thing that we don't think God would have created, and therefore, 
the blind watchmaker must be able to do with it. It's much like David Hull's argument in Nature. So I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't say that it's valueless. It's kind of interesting, but it's very far from concluding the matter. Um, Professor Johnson, your lecture drew evidence based on evolutionary biology. And could you comment a little bit on the mathematical and probabilistic challenges of evolution and what your view on that is? Well, you know, um, uh, I, um, I can, I'll tell you, um, as much as I know, I hope not more than that, um, because I, uh, I'm very cautious in approaching the mathematical issues. Uh, but there was a great um, confrontation, which is discussed in my book and a number of others in this uh, field, that was held in 1967 at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. And it came about because some professors of mathematics, uh, physics, engineering, that sort of thing, were arguing with some of the leading neo-Darwinists, uh, Meyer, Medawar, and so on, um, about the probability of Darwinistic evolution. Um, now, the, the real problem behind this, as I see it, is this. You see, the mutation has to provide somehow something, you know, a new design feature, or the beginning of it, step by step, and you have to have more mutations all the time. The, um, the Darwinian answer is given by Dawkins and by others is we concede, they will say, that you can't have wings or eyes or anything like that emerging in one jump because that's a miracle. That's statistically impossible. Do all that design in one thing. That's, that's like the, you know, the, uh, a, a miraculous transformation. But they say it could be done naturally if you had lots and lots of tiny mutations, one after another, that accumulated. In my way of thinking, that's unsound reasoning. Because while it's easier to imagine any single tiny mutation than a single big one, you lose that in the quantity you have to have. You have to have them arriving. How many? You know, all on schedule in the right place where they can be taken advantage of. So I think it's very hard to calculate the probabilities uh, uh, of that, that they're either incalculable um, or, um, as I say, many have argued that it's supremely unlikely. But I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to go any farther than that in judging the matter because um, I, think it's, I think it's just very hard even to define the terms and I, I'm certainly not, um, you know, uh, in that field. In speaking of mutations, you talk about um, micromutations. Uh, when your DNA replicates, when your cells replicate, it makes a mistake about once every three million times. And because, it's because your DNA is so long, that ends up with a lot of point mutations. Now because 95%, as you say, of our DNA is extra, most of those point mutations don't show up as anything. They end up making the same protein they would have in the first place. But those point mutations that do show up would then change the animal some, somehow. And those mutations could stay if they were, would be evolutionarily beneficial mm -hmm. if they help the animal live. Now the only question I really had is that you understood about micromutations and you said that, um, that macromutations didn't really happen or that it would be a miracle. The official Darwinist view is that they are not important in you know, constructing new forms. They might happen occasionally, but that they can't be, couldn't be relied on. OK, well, the question was, was that you said that all these micromutations would have to show up and help each other, but it is proven by watching DNA replicate that it does make millions of replicate millions of mistakes and so that would cause mm -hmm. slight mutations and only the ones that were beneficial or that helped each other would show up yes now you know the way i would characterize your point is that it seems to me you are supporting you know the the underlying logic of a darwinist evolution and what it establishes to me is that, as a matter of first impression at least, the neo-Darwinian theory is a respectable hypothesis. That is to say, you know, it's not unreasonable for somebody to advance this as a possibility, to say there's a, you know, it's logically uh, uh, supportable. Uh, but then one really has to say beyond that, did it really happen that way? You know, can we confirm that this sort of thing actually does produce new um, complex organs? Uh, again and again, you know, uh, uh, the eye uh, exists in at least 40 different 
separate designs that according again to official Darwinist views would have had to evolve at least 40 times independently. So what one has to have is the number of constructive mutations of exactly the right sort that provide all of the improvements that are necessary to, to get the eye working in those many different forms. And, they, and in fact, they have to provide everything all at once, at least to the point of having some basic usefulness to the thing, or, you know, or otherwise it won't help the animal to survive and, and to reproduce. So you know, one might, I might be, you know, be, I'm ha perfectly happy to say that it's no wonder that scientists were attracted to this idea and wanted to investigate it, hoped it would be true, but the question is, does it really fit all the evidence when the evidence is analyzed without a bias in favor of the theory? So you know, I think what you've showed is, is, is what I'm very happy to concede, that it was a hypothesis worthy of testing, and that the argument, of course, can still go. Maybe it still is. You say all these things about how um, Darwinian evolution has to take place in the form of step-by-step microevolution caused by micro mutations. And in your example of the bat, you talk yeah. about, you, you say that the mutations have to occur on schedule, and that's one of the problems with the theory. But in your speech, you seem to ignore what is, the, what is regarded as the most important method of genetic evolution, which, which is sexual rep, uh, reproduction causing... Recombination. Differences. Yes. Yeah. In other words, um, the ideas are originated by Mendel that the reason you are different from your parents is not because your genes mutated when you were conceived, but because your parents' genes combined into a sure. new unique pattern. Why do you fail to address that method? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to repair that defect uh, right now. Uh, uh, the um, a recombination, by, as its term says, it recombines what's already there. It certainly accounts for why you're different from your parents. You know, that genetic recombination creates you know, is what's responsible for the individual varieties within, you know, the human species. But what we need is something that adds something new. Recombination doesn't explain how bacteria turn into human beings. It doesn't, and, and that, you know, it doesn't explain innovation. It recombines what's already there and creates variation within the type. Your, your point is, I, I, with all due respect, it, it appears to me to be a further confusion of um, the, you know, the, the naturally occurring variation within the type with the major innovative process that I'm referring to under the heading of the blind watchmaker thesis. I would say that given the billions of years involved in the evolution of life that such slow changes is caused by recombination could explain evolution. And I would ask another question. You say that uh, there's no evidence in the fossil record of the gradual changes that are, would be predicted by step-by-step -step evolution. Um, would you say that, human, they, that humans in general have not changed over the last several thousand years, that we are genetically oh. identical to our ancestors? Oh, they, you know, ago? again, there is unquestionably variation within the species. You know, even the, even the strictest creationist uh, position um, would, uh, agrees that, uh, um, and, 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 and by the way, agrees with the, uh, the, the mitochondrial Eve hypothesis, at any rate, version of Darwinist theory, that um, all of the um, you know, races and varieties of human beings uh, diversified from an ancestral pair, or a small number of ancestors, however you, know, I, I, you want to put that. So un undoubtedly, um, the variation within the type uh, occurs. The, the, however, to produce, the question is whether this produces major innovations. Now, you see, what you're doing, again, is, is exactly the Darwinist line of reasoning. You say, well, it seems plausible, and so it happens. And there's a lot of time, and so it happens. We can extrapolate. All of that's really just assuming the theory is true. That's a real question. Can we? Does the same process that produces the variations in the beaks of finches on the Galapagos uh, produce finches in the first place? I believe that if one puts that on the table to answer before the entire scientific community and gets them to give it a fair hearing, the answer is going to be no. And as I say, you know, it's not like this is some idiosyncratic view of mine. It's essentially what Steve Gould said in his 1980 paper and what many others have. Now, whether you're, you know, you disagree or you're not convinced, well, you know, lots of people aren't. There's disagreement. That's why they have horse races. But um, uh, the, um, that's the point I want to put on the table for uh, argument, and I'm confident of prevailing in the end. Dr. Johnson, I find that many people that believe in evolution don't understand the time problem or the statistical improbability of evolution. 
Dr. E. A. Wilder Smith in looking at DNA and RNA has demonstrated that problem. Could you comment a little yeah. bit about that? I, I'm, oh, I've read uh, Wilder Smith's uh, uh, work, and um, I find it very impressive and, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, persuasive. Um, let me say, by the way, um, you know, uh, just on the wording thing, you know, I, I've taken a vow never to answer a question with the word evolution in it, because it's such a, you know, uh, it's, uh, so I'll, I'll go back to talking about the blind watchmaker thesis to avoid the microevolution and all of that. Uh, but that is persuasive to me. I don't know whether it's totally unanswerable or not. What I would really be satisfied by, what I want to achieve, what I'd like to see happen, is for arguments like those of Wilder Smith to get on the table and be considered by the scientific community fairly and on their merits. They can't be under the present philosophical state of things, you see, because they're negative arguments. And the, the answer of the Dobzhanskys and so on is, no, 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 we want you either to support our theory or improve it, not to tell us it's all wrong. So I, I, think, I think, frankly, my, my own opinion is that if those theories were fairly considered, if those objections were, they would be devastating and would be accepted and that that's the problem. But I won't state that dogmatically because I don't you know, know of all the possible responses that might be made. And if we get the fair discussion, then I'm willing to live with the outcome, whatever it may be. And I'm sure Wilder Smith is too. Uh, it seems to me that if there is anybody who's ever claimed uh, a monopoly on the truth of existence, uh, it's been religion. And the reason I bring the subject up is because uh, on your card here you have the place where you can mark, if you're interested to talk with somebody about how I can get to know God personally, I could mark that. Implied in that is that somebody is going to call me back who claims that they know God better than I do or they do at all. All right. You know, let me uh, address the subject of religion. Uh, for a moment. It's another word. You know, I talked about creation, evolution, science. I just want to talk about religion because I think religion is a false category. Um, uh, the category I would substitute for religion would be something like basic beliefs about where we came from and what our place in the general scheme of things is. Now, changing the terminology now, I need a single word. I realize that's an awkward formulation, but bear with me and uh, perhaps you'll see the point that I'm trying to make is that you see everybody has such beliefs. And they're of different kinds. Some people say, as I would, that we're here because of an intelligent, purposeful creator brought us into existence for a purpose. Other people hold a different opinion. They say, no, 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 it's haphazard, natural, material processes. No intelligence, life is an accident. Um, that, and you know, that's the, the, the Gould position or the Dawkins position. Now, both of those are different opinions about the same topic. It's not like I have a religion and Dawkins doesn't. You know, I have a religion and he has science. That's a tendentious, misleading, deceptive way of putting the thing. We both have our opinions about these ultimate questions. He's entitled to his view, I'm entitled to mine, and we're entitled to argue about it. And if there's evidence that bears on it, it should be fairly considered. Um, and many people in, the, you know, in, re in religious matters are dogmatic. You know, there are plenty of dogmatic God believers who I think ought to be less dogmatic than they are. But I'll tell you this, I never knew what dogmatism was until I started dealing with evolutionary biologists. <laughs> and there's a reason. There's a reason for this. I've under come to understand the reason. I think you'll be able to understand it too. Suppose, let's say you're a, I don't know, let's say a fundamentalist preacher of some kind or whatever, religious uh, extremist, if you like, whatever you want to say. However you want to put it, I don't want to, uh, whatever words you choose to use, and you want to be dogmatic. You'd love to really tell people what to think. Now, in this culture, you've got to set limits on yourself. The reason is, is because your family, your friends, your, your congregation, whatever it is, listens to the radio, they watch television, they see some newspapers, and they hear a lot of contending views. And you know necessarily that there are cultural authorities, people you have to take seriously, the leaders of science and philosophy and so on, who hold a different view. So you sort of have to be able to come to grips with their thinking. You have to treat it with a certain degree of seriousness, even if you'd like to just shut it out. You really don't have that. It's not easy to do that in our culture. But suppose you're a senior professor, maybe a Nobel Prize winner. Not, you don't have to be that, but just a senior professor at the University of California in one of its campuses in science, prestigious. You don't have to take seriously anybody that doesn't think just like you do. You're aware that there are people out there who don't, but they're just, you know, members of the less educated classes. Uh, you don't take them seriously. And I've noticed this. As a result, the notion is everybody that's intelligent thinks like we do. 
Uh, you know, that, that's the, the notion that's intelligent in the higher university of faculties. So that's why you get such a much more powerful dogmatism there. And many of the people, one of the tragic things about it is they don't even know they're dogmatic. They're perfectly open-minded with respect to anything that's reasonable. And what's reasonable is exactly the way they think. So if you want dogmatism, come to the great universities. Um, I'm there, I know. Uh, I've seen it. Um, uh, you can trust me. Yes, yeah. OK, Dr. Johnson, it seems um, I know that you don't espouse either or uh, creation or evolution, but most of people who would go on the creation side uh, looking to debunk evolution, it seems, oh, I'm sorry, the blind watch. Thanks, boy. I, I really accomplished something. You, uh, you've won my heart. Uh, <laughs> make your point. I'm disposed to agree with you. OK, it seems. <laughs> It seems you had uh, three major points debunking uh, that theory. One is lack of interbreeding of species and the limits of the gene pool elasticity. And the major ones seem to be, um, say, such as the Cambrian bloom, the two, mu the two other points. Make the Cambrian it, explosion. Yeah, Cambrian yeah. explosion. Make it uh, impossible for um, the small animals to go to large ones. But you said that's also not only in the Cambrian area, but in other areas? No. Uh, I, I, let, me, let me clarify my point, because I think you may have, may have misunderstood. The Cambrian explosion is the most spectacular, sort of best known example of, of something which is general in the fossil record. Um, and that is this phenomenon, I'm using Steve Gould's language here, by the way, of sudden appearance followed by stasis. Now, as, as Gould explains in Wonderful Life, and his analysis of this until he gets into his personal philosophy is very good, um, what you would expect if the Darwinian theory is true is that you see you start out with one life form and then it diversifies and diversifies and diversifies. You start out with species, and then you get several of those, and then you get the higher levels, families and orders, and finally phyla, and you get continual diversification. This is what he calls the cone of increasing uh, diversification. Now, what instead you have, what you see in the fossil record of the Cambrian era, is almost the opposite of that. You see all the general divisions, the phyla, the basic body plans of animals, appearing um, at the start of complex animal life. And such diversification as occurs is strictly within those boundaries. Some of the things that exist become extinct. And then in new forms of rock, there are new, new, new things that appear, but it's within those, those boundaries. Now, this can be described as evolution as a sort, of a sort. You know, again, if one accepts the physical description and, 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 and so on like that. Um, but it's really the opposite of what one would expect of the Darwinian picture. I understand that. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's and that's generally just, true throughout the fossil record. Uh, okay. so I'm sorry, I, I thought you oh. didn't from the way you put it. I, no, no problem. Okay. Um, saying that is, that, that is true, that, that mm. as yeah. far as we know cannot happen naturally, then um, it has happened more than once. So taking from a creationist theory, if it could only happen through a creator, then the creator didn't do it, didn't create sudden, oh, oh. just once, but multiple times yeah. over the... Uh, of time. Well, I don't know. See, there are a lot of different positions on this, as you may well be aware. There's uh, a young earth, you know, a, a complete creation, and the, the, then there's progressive creation. There's guided evolution, you know, of some kind. And I don't feel that on the basis of the information available to us now, if you look at it as simply as a scientific question without bringing anything else into it, that you can really settle exactly what happened. And one reason why it's hard to settle is because, of course, even a critic like myself or anyone else that's an, you know, a critic of the system is dependent upon the data that have been provided by people who have a strong theoretical orientation. Now, my belief is, and this is a speculation, you know, it's, it's not science, it's, a, it's a, a speculative hypothesis, but about science, is that if, it, if the critique of the blind watchmaker thesis got on the board, and if it were successful as I expect it to be, if it got a fair hearing, and if then the scientific community had to say, you know, we were wrong about that. We said we'd solved that problem, and we really hadn't. I think it would lead to a reexamination, an audit of the books, as it were, in many areas, and the facts would be different. Now, this is not something disrespectful of science or really, you know, outrageous to say. It's just saying that a paradigm shift, you know, causes a whole vast chain of effects and so on, and this, I think, is generally uh, understood. Uh, so maybe some of the things that we think are true, even that I accept as a matter of description, aren't. Um, all I can say on the basis of what I know uh, of the evidence and what I think is known of the evidence is that 
The blind watchmaker kind of evolution doesn't appear to be what happened. If you look at the evidence as a whole without a bias, it seems to be out. That settles the most important philosophical claim that the neo-Darwinists made. No, they haven't you know, explained uh, the design. And that comes back then in full force. But I think uh, there's a whole mystery then remaining about exactly how it, what happened and how to tie it in with the evidence. And I just don't know beyond that. Uh, and uh, you know, then, you know, so that's, that's where I'd have to leave it. Hi there. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I think you're a very good speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Probably convince most of these people that, you know, grass is red or something like that. But, um, but. What's that? A but. <laughs> but no. I want to hear what comes after okay. the but. <laughs> uh, I, I, I took some notes on uh, what, what you were saying, and I'd like to bring up some points that I think maybe were inconsistencies, and I'd like to see if maybe you, know, you, can, you can justify them or something like that. Uh, one of them, first of all, your argument about um, the evolution of wings, for example, when you said, well, uh, you're going to get these prototype flaps, and they're going to kind of get in the way of the ability to grasp. Okay, first of all, I'd like to say, well, it, isn't it possible that instead of using arms for grasping on a limb, you can use your legs? And once you've built up your legs so you can jump well enough, your arms are not going to be used for grasping, for example. Yes, yeah, so what I'm saying? Yeah, so in that yeah. case, it wouldn't get in the way. Okay, I'll answer that one right away. That, that is a, a conceivable. However, remember that that tiny prototype wing flap in Dawkins' view just gave the minutest statistical, you know, better odds of, of surviving a fall from a certain height. It's by definition a very, very tiny improvement that, you know, but if it makes some difference, it's enough. So it would also only have to make a small, a very small difference in the efficiency of the climbing grasping uh, techniques uh, to cancel that out. Uh, so in time, the animal that couldn't use uh, the, 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 you know, the, the forelegs uh, might develop a greater capacity to use the back legs. I agree with that. But the question is whether or not, you know, the, uh, the uh, disadvantage wouldn't cancel out the advantage. Now, we really can't tell by spinning hypothetical stories. That's why they're satirically called just so stories. You know, the question is how can we really confirm this experimentally with fossil history or whatever um, in, in even a single case? I think we can't. Okay. <laughs> Try me on one more, anyway. Uh, let's see. One more. Um, Since you said I was a good speaker, I want to. Okay. <laughs> um, let's try uh, macro, um, you know, watchmaker Lucian, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> you had some problems. The drunken that. watchmaker, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you had some problems with that, and you based it on, for example, with fossil records that show jumps from what uh, natural history, you know, appears to have made. Now, I don't know, taking a stab in, you know, in the dark, I would say probably less than one hundredth of a percent of life that's ever existed on this planet, I think, left even a record that we can find today. Not, not, not even including what kind of um, continental shifts have you know, taken place where now we've got um, you know, biological records completely forever destroyed. I, I would, a very, very small percentage Mm -hmm. In other words, what I'm so the evidence is just missing. Yeah, so what I could see is why not maybe certain uh, populations of, of uh, species be existing in a part of the world where there's a lot of uh, yeah. volcanic action or anything, or they're, they're going to be later submerged under sea so that a lot yeah. of change can occur before those same species are in a place where there can be a record of something. Okay, I, yeah, I, I've, I've got the question, and, and uh, it's, it's something I deal with, I think, very thoroughly in chapters four, five, and six of the uh, book. And let me just say that, um, of course, if you start out with the assumption that the Darwinian theory is true, um, then you can always account for the absence of evidence. You know, it's been lost. It was there, but it wasn't fossilized or whatever. Um, but of course, if you're not assuming that the theory is true, then it's a much bigger problem. Darwin himself in The Origin said, I never would have realized how imperfect the fossil record was if, if it hadn't occurred to me that it totally fails to provide the transitionals required by my theory. And it never occurred to him to think that, the, that this might mean that the theory was false and that that is, is true. So that's another option one has to consider. But beyond that, I do agree. I think that in any single case, you can explain the absence of a record of transitions on the grounds that the fossil record is imperfect and incomplete. I don't think that's illegitimate at all. However, there are an awful lot of cases, and there's a tremendous amount of dedicated searching that has been going on by paleontologists who thought they'd be able to document transitions. And the result, I've got plenty of documentation of this in the book, has been failure. So 
I think it's time to consider the possibility that they weren't there. Now, finally, this very argument is the reason why I myself place more emphasis on the fact of stasis, the fact that once things are there, they stay the same. Because you see, that's not a matter of the absence of evidence, that's positively documented across the you know, a geological column. And so it's not a matter of just saying that the evidence was lost. It's, and, and if the theory were true, you would expect these things to be more or less continually changing, although not necessarily at the same rate. Um, and, and that it's the opposite. You know, in Futama's, in that uh, biology, biology textbook I mentioned before, he says the other thing besides that Darwin contributed, like Marx and Freud, to the program of mechanistic materialism, he says Darwin taught us to see mutability and not stasis as the fundamental fact of you know, biological life. Well, yeah, he did, and as a result, everybody ignored the fact that the record establishes stasis. They just didn't see it. Uh, thanks very much uh, for your questions, challenging and otherwise much appreciated.